Eddie Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. I'm sorry if we're a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. And now, I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Oh, thank you, Mama. But I am quite comfortable where I am. <laughs> Good heavens, Lane, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially for Aunt Augusta. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. <laughs> that will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers, not even for ready money. And I'm afraid, Aunt Augusta, I will have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight after all. I have just received a telegram to say that Paul Bunbury is very ill again. They seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, Paul Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Adrenal, that I think it's high time Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. <laughs> this surely showing with the question is absurd. I should be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury, for me, to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, but I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season when everyone had practically said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. Well, I'll talk to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he's still conscious. And I think I can promise you he will be all right by Saturday. But if you'd like, kindly come into the next room with me. I can go over the program I've drawn up. Thank you, Algernon. It is very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the program will be delightful after a few expurgations. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Oh, certainly, Mama. <laughs> Charming day we're having, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't speak to me of the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever anyone speaks to me of the weather, I feel quite certain that they mean something else. <laughs> and that makes me so nervous. <laughs> well, I, I do mean something else. Oh, well, I thought so, and I am never wrong. Right. Well, I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. Oh, I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. <laughs> Well, uh, Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I have ever met since... Well, since I met you. <laughs> I am quite aware of the fact, and I had hoped that in public, at any rate, we would have been more demonstrative. For me, you have always held an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We, we live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. And my ideal has always been to love a man with the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first told me that he had a friend named Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn. Oh, passionately. My own Ernest. But you don't mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. <laughs> yes, darling, I know it is. Uh, but to speak quite candidly, I don't much care for the name of Ernest. I don't think that name suits me at all. Oh, well, it suits you perfectly, dear. It is a divine name. It has music of its own. It produces vibration. <laughs> really? Good um, I must say, I think there are lots of other much, much nicer names. I think that, um, I don't know. Jack, for instance, <laughs> is a charming name. Jack! <laughs> no. There is very little music in the name 
Jack a penny at all. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. The only really safe name is Ernest. I must get christened at once. I mean, Gwendolyn, we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, surely. You know that I love you, and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. Oh, well, I adore you. But you haven't proposed to me yet. No, Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? Oh, I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any further disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it's only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, darling, what have you to say to me? Well, you know what I have to say to you. <laughs> yes, dear, but you don't say it. <laughs> Gwendolyn. Excuse me. Right. <laughs> Gwendolyn. Yes, dear. Will you marry me? Oh, well, of course I will, darling. <laughs> but how long you have been about it. <laughs> oh, Ernest, what wonderfully blue eyes you have. Promise me you will always look at Mr. Me. Worthing! Rise, sir, from this semi recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. <laughs> Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you, and Mr. <laughs> Worthing <laughs> is not quite finished yet. Finished what? May I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I will inform you of the fact. <laughs> An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise. It is hardly a matter she could be allowed to arrange for herself. And now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn! <laughs> 